Well, hi everyone, and thanks to the organizers for the chance to speak. This is really exciting. Uh, it's great to be able to give another seminar um, since I've been stuck at home. So as is uh, typically the kind of thing that I do, I changed the talk at the last minute. So sorry if you were hoping to hear exactly what I said I was gonna talk about. The talk I'm gonna give you today is basically split into two parts. So the first is more like a review because I thought the system we work on, uh, the cyanobacterial clock, I find quite fascinating. I think others may find it fascinating too, and you may not know about it. So I first wanna tell you some of the highlights of what's been learned about that system. And then the second half of the talk, I wanna tell you about some very recent findings from our lab. And I think in the spirit of this seminar, these are uh, findings that I find quite exciting, but we don't really know what they mean. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the leading edge of what we understand. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can make this work. All right, so here's an introduction to circadian rhythms. So I think that everyone sort of feels that this field was started um, by this French guy, de Marin, who you know, everyone knew that many plants changed their morphology uh, between day and night. So like a mimosa will have its leaves open during the day and then at night, those leaves will close when it no longer needs to photosynthesize. And what de Marin did was an experiment putting that plant into an enclosed constant environment where there was a low light all the time. And what he discovered was that that opening and closing of leaves is not actually caused by the light and dark. It's an endogenous rhythm inside the plant that just follows the day and night cycle. So the leaves keep opening and closing even though the environment's not changing. Well, the same thing turns out to be true for most animals, plants, and I'll show you uh, bacteria as well. So our bodies also go through endogenously generated cycles that control when we wanna go to sleep, when we're most alert, our blood pressure, et cetera. These have lots of connection to disease that are only, many of which are only being uncovered now. Okay, so these so-called circadian rhythms, what are their properties? Well, they're free running, that's the first thing, that they're supposed to run even if the environment is not changing. They all have this, this property called temperature compensation, which is to say the period is not supposed to change very much if the temperature increases, which you can understand uh, in the sense that if it's warmer or colder, time still runs at the same rate. So you should still take about a day to go through the cycle. And while these cycles can free run, they're supposed to be able to entrain or synchronize or phase lock, you could say, to the external light dark cycle caused by the rotation of the earth. Okay, so. Um, so the system I've become quite fascinated by is really the simplest example of a system, uh, a circadian rhythm system, and it comes from bacteria. It comes from this photosynthetic bacteria called Synecococcus elongatus. That's what most has mostly been studied. And I'll show you a movie. Uh, this is cells growing in a constant environment with a yellow fluorescent protein expressed from a clock promoter. So you can see that even though they're doubling uh, faster than a day, they and the environment is not changing. They have this daily expression, daily rhythm and expression of this protein. Now, um, these four people are in some ways some of the key founders of the field. I put them on this slide. Uh, and they took a bacterial genetics approach to identify the genes responsible for this rhythm. And there turned out to be quite a simple answer. So this is this experimental apparatus they built. And they tracked mutations that got rid of the rhythm to these three genes that they named Chi A, Chi B, and Chi C, which had never really been described before. Uh, but they're found throughout cyanobacteria and in other bacteria. And um, if you're curious, the word chi, though I don't speak Japanese, um, here's the kanji character for it, and it's essentially the word for cycle. So these are the cycle genes. That's where the name comes from. And if you delete those genes, you lose the rhythms I was just showing you in the bacteria. But I think what's, what really has captured many people's imagination, it turns out if you take the protein products of these genes, so purified chi ABC proteins, and you mix them in a test tube, uh, what you see is there's a free running rhythm in the phosphorylation of this protein called chi C. So that's what these upper bands show on a gel. Here, every lane is sampled, each lane is sampled every two hours. And if you plot this, what you see is a nearly 24 hour self sustaining oscillation in phosphorylation. So somehow these proteins can work together to give you a stable uh, cycle that takes about a day. And that's essentially. Um, well, that's kind of the magic of this purified protein system. So I mentioned there were these three conditions for um, something to be a real circadian rhythm. One is it's supposed to be free running, which you can see this protein mixture is. Actually, it can go on for 
at least a couple weeks um, on its own. Um, the second was temperature compensation. So that turns out to be true as well. So here's a really nice paper showing that. You can basically see as you change the temperature, the amplitude of this protein oscillator changes. It decreases as the temperature falls, but the period is nearly unchanged. Okay, so that, and that's still quite mysterious how that works, but that's the second criteria. So the period is not really changing with temperature. And the third criteria is that it's supposed to be entrainable to light dark cycles. Well, these proteins don't sense light themselves, but one of the major themes my lab has been working on is that this oscillator is intimately connected to metabolism. And that's because in a photosynthetic organism, uh, light is intimately related to the production of energy and reducing equivalents in the cell. And I'll show you later that the clock then feeds back onto metabolism. But um, so here's a sample of that kind of work. So it turns out when you put these cyanobacteria into the dark, the ratio between ATP and ADP, so a measure of the, of the available biochemical energy, falls. So there's, a, there's much more ATP than ADP in the light, and then ATP levels fall in the dark, and ADP comes up. And if you recapitulate those kind of cycles in this test tube reaction, switching from high ATP ADP ratio to low, you can synchronize the phosphorylation rhythm to this driving force. So indeed, uh, this oscillator will synchronize to a day-night cycle if the day-night cycle is mimicked by metabolites. So really this protein says, so this is I think quite remarkable that these three purified proteins, this mixture, satisfy all of these criteria, temperature compensation, entrainability, free running with a period of about 24 hours. And so the mechanism underlying all these things is in some ways really still not understood but it's a remarkable system. Okay, so um, I just argued that these metabolic rhythms entrain the clock, right? You can cycle ATP, ADP ratio, and that entrains the oscillator. What turns out to be true in the cell is that the, the, the state of the clock then alters metabolism. So it's really deeply embedded in a, in a feedback loop, and I'll just show you a little bit of data about that. So when the environment cycles between day and night, cells store up glycogen, so they can't do photosynthesis at night. So during the day, they store up glycogen, and then they burn that glycogen in the night to support whatever metab metabolic needs they have. But just like the mimosa leaves opening and closing, this cycle of glycogen storage and consumption is not actually caused by the light and dark. It happens even if the environment is constant. So the clock dictates a time to store glycogen and a time to burn glycogen. So that's an example of metabolism being controlled by the clock. Um, and then here are a pair of papers that are quite nice. I won't go into in great, great detail, but they basically show when you, when you have a, a defect in clock-driven gene expression, cells have trouble tolerating light-dark cycles. You can see uh, wild-type cells grow well and the clock cells fail to grow. And that's essentially linked to a metabolic defect. That's the message of this slide. And in particular, that defect can be rescued. Here's a paper from uh, Anna Kusinski from Aaron O'Shea's lab. By activating metabolic pathways that are not normally on uh, at the, that are not normally on in the morning, you can fix the defect uh, in these clock mutant cells in light dark cycles. So the, the point of all of this is to say that the clock and metabolism are intimately connected to each other. Another way to fix this viability uh, defect, this is a paper from Susan Golden's lab, is to make mutations that impair amino acid biosynthesis. So if you shut off production of this valine leucine isoleucine pathway, that also helps these clock mutants survive in the dark. Okay, so the clock, the clock uh, is entrained by metabolic signals, by energy changes in nucle this nucleotide ratio. So light causes metabolic changes that entrains the clock, but then the clock also through transcriptional control, um, controls glycogen storage, amino acid biosynthesis, pentose phosphate pathway. So the two are really intimately linked. And this seems to be a connection that transcends all kingdoms of life. So our clocks, like in our liver, are also intimately connected to metabolism. So that's the point. Um, that's kind of the end of the review part of the talk. So I have, now it's the second half. So all of this is to really say, so, so from all of that information, I think what you take away is that it must be that the clock regulation of metabolic enzyme activity in the dark is very important. Because if you don't have the right metabolic pathways active or if amino acid biosynthesis is too active, 
you may not, the cells may not be able to survive the dark, but how, how is that actually achieved, right? How, how is the activity of metabolic enzymes controlled? Well, it turns out that the, like, a common way that we think about regulation of, of pathways, which is through control of gene expression, is probably not a good candidate. So as soon as the cells go into, into the dark, uh, their transcriptional machinery is, in, is rapidly shut down. So there's some genes that can still be expressed, but if you look at the total mRNA in the cell, compared to being in the light, it falls by a factor of 10 or so uh, within the first couple of hours of being in dark. Similarly, translation is strongly suppressed. So most of the ribosomes are dimerized by this thing called hibernation promoting factor, and there's just not a lot of new protein synthesis. So there's not a lot of transcription, there's not a lot of translation. So this leads you to think if you're going to control the activity of metabolic pathways, it's going to have to be something beyond transcription and translation. Right. So, um, so this led us to think like, well, what could be going on? And of course, there's, um, you, you may know there's been this excitement in, in the past several years in eukaryotic cells with this kind of renewed appreciation that phase separation mechanisms or aggregation mechanisms are often used to respond to, to stress. Um, and also to serve other regulatory functions in eukaryotic cells. So this is a paper from Alan Drummond's lab where they did a detailed study of uh, what proteins phase separate in response to heat shock in budding yeast. Okay, so rather than just thinking about all the proteins in the cell within a compartment as uniformly mixed, it turns out under some conditions you can have these dynamic condensates form. So we wanted to ask, is the same thing possibly going on in bacterial cells even though the kinds of proteins that typically phase separate in eukaryotic cells are not found so much in bacterial genomes. So here's the experiment we did. We basically grew um, these cyanobacteria in a light dark cycle. So like the way they, trying to mimic the way they normally grow. They can grow during the day, they can do photosynthesis, and they have to stop growing at night, tolerate that time of metabolic limitation, and then they can resume growth the next day. And then during the day and then, and then again at night, we would harvest cells, um, broke them open, and then we used this kind of very simple assay. This actually was developed by Alan Drummond's group. So we use an ultra centrifuge. So we spin this, the super, we spin the lysate at high speed. So things that are bigger than about a mega Dalton will pellet in the ultra centrifuge. So you get a pellet of protein and other stuff at the bottom, and then you get this soluble protein. And you can use this kind of crude fractionation to basically take the soluble stuff and the insoluble stuff, and then shoot it on a mass spec and ask what's there. Okay, so here's what happens. So based, so here we're calling the percent soluble, how much of each protein in the proteome we see in the supernatant versus in the pellet. Uh, and so in general, you, you, when you do this experiment, you get scatter plots that look kind of like this. So there's a, there's a scatter plot so that being more soluble in the day is generally correlated with being more soluble at night, but there's this kind of tail that hangs down where you have some proteins that are very soluble during the day, and then at night, um, they, be, they, they mostly go into the pellet. And so what are some examples of what you see in this tail? Where well, here is Chi-C, actually, the circadian clock enzyme, and that actually was known from other experiments people had done, not proteome-wide experiments, but you see all the clock components in there. Um, you also see a lot of proteases. You see enzymes involved in DNA repair. You see all of the GGDEF domain proteins, which I won't comment on because I don't really know what the story is. These are diguanolate cyclases, if there's any, any aficionados out there. Um, but what I'm going to focus on mostly for the rest of what I'm going to tell you is you see a lot of enzymes in amino acid biosynthesis pathways. So like this MET-X protein, for example, on uh, AST. So actually, if you, if you color code um, it's kind of diagram of central metabolism with the proteins that you find in this little yellow box, which is how we tried to capture this tail. Oops. Uh, again. You do see um, many enzymes that are here, like in the, in, in, these are biosynthetic pathways that are producing aspartate, lysine, threonine, right? So you see many enzymes that are basically taking material out of glycolysis and out of the TCA pathway to make amino acids. Okay. So um, we wanted to know more of what was going on. So we tried to then take some of these proteins and tag them with uh, YFP and then make live cell movies. So um, hopefully you'll be able to see these. Here is, uh, here's a movie with MET-X fused to YFP. So this is the, basically the first committed step in making methionine. You can see during the day, 
um, it's, you see uniform fluorescence and then at night you see these spots appear. And then there, that was, that, that whole movie is about um, 60 hours long. We'll just play it again. So uniform fluorescence, the lights go out, you see spots appear, the lights come back on, the spots go away, and then you can go through another cycle. Um, here's another movie. So there's a spartate, semialde um, spartate semialdehyde dehydrogenase. Similarly, uniform during the day, and then you see spots at night. And I want to, and so here's quantification. Each of these lines is single cells, basically the number of spots detected. Um, and the top line is total fluorescence. I don't want to, I don't want to lull you into um, boredom with too many movies, but uh, here's another one, tyrosine phosphatase, similar kind of story. You can see it's kind of like you know, different kinetics and maybe of these different proteins, you see like different, maybe more or less spots. This one's kind of interesting, the prolyl 4 hydroxylase. You actually see two waves of spots at night. So you see like an initial wave and then a later wave. So that's kind of something exciting going on there that we don't totally understand. So you can see here in the quantification, you see an initial wave goes away and then another wave comes back later in the night. Okay. So that's kind of the phenomenon. And then we wanted to know, well, like what is going on? So one possibility is maybe these proteins are um, somehow in the night, they're kind of like misfolding and aggregating and they basically become some kind of trash that the cell has to get rid of. Um, but we don't think that's true. So we think these proteins are ultimately not degraded. We think they're ultimately reused the next day. They returned, they're returned to the soluble pool of protein. So I'll try to show you data for that. So here's sort of film strips and you can ask um, what is the total fluorescence intensity in the, in the cytosol and then what is the total fluorescence intensity in the, these spots. So this is just trying to quantify the images and in general what you see is as the spot intensity goes up the background fluorescence is going down right so that's like proteins going from soluble to the spots but then when the lights come back on the spots go away and that's correlated with the background coming back up, which suggests that the, the YFP that was in the spots goes back into the cytosol. It's not chewed up by proteases. It's not like the fluorescence is decreasing. So that's kind of a correlational argument. We wanted to do something a little more um, rigorous. So what we did was we tried to label isotopically the old protein, or sorry, the new protein. So before we turned the lights on, um, we added a heavy leucine uh, label actually was a pain to get the cells to take figure out which amino acid they would actually take up effectively but anyway before the lights come back on we give them a lot of this uh, isotopically labeled leucine so that new new polypeptides that are synthesized with this leucine will be distinguishable in mass spec because they have this 13 carbon 6 carbon 13 atoms um, and what you see essentially is that if you compare the whole proteome, so note this is on a log scale. So most proteins, whether they're in this like dark demixing, what we call these proteins that switch between soluble and insoluble, whether they're in that pool in the red or the whole proteome, most proteins are really not incorporating much of this label at all, implying that they're like stable proteins. The proteins you see in the soluble fraction are old. Most of them are old from the previous day. Though you can see there are some proteins that must be rapidly turned over because they can become almost 100% labeled with heavy leucine. So I, the conclusion really from this experiment is that the, the proteins that are switching between soluble and insoluble statistically are really not different from the whole proteome. In other words, they're not being rapidly trashed and then rebuilt or turned over really quickly or something. So most of them are stable and seem to be reused from one day to the next. Um, Okay, so there's a reversible cycle of enzymes between soluble and insoluble, which makes us think that this is regulated in some way. And I'll, I'll show you just basically two more pieces of data. Um, the first is that it turns out this, the state of the circadian rhythm, which is what I started telling you about, turns out to determine when this protein condensation will occur. So here, it, for, these are just side-by-side -side examples. If you put, um, the cells into the dark when they're supposed to go into the dark. It takes them a while for these proteins to condense. Uh, so here, after an hour for MEDEX, you don't see anything. But if you put the cells in the dark at the wrong time, it happens very rapidly. Um, you can achieve the same thing by mutating 
or a similar effect by mutating genes in the clock pathway. So here, if we knock out the, I'll show you, I'll just look on the graph over here to start with. So the wild type is in blue. That's basically the kinetics with which these things are supposed to condense, your MEDX, ASD. If you delete the clock, now you get this altered, it, it still eventually happens, but it's delayed. So this, it's not happening at the right time. And if you delete these genes SASE and KIKE, which also screw up the clock's output signaling, you either get that these things form really quickly, or if you delete KIKE, they don't form at all. So you go through the whole night and you're still soluble. So somehow the clock is exerting an influence that we don't understand over um, this you know, separation between soluble and insoluble. And here's just a movie to show that. This is, uh, shows very rapidly when SASE is deleted, you get spot, these MetX spots, foci form like within an hour. That's rapid in our world. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what's happening to these proteins in the night, right? Like why is this happening? Um, I, some possibilities, it, what, here are a few possibilities. We don't really know the answer. I'm throwing these out here to sort of provoke discussion or your, some insight from someone in the audience. So maybe ATP depletion in the dark is leading to decreased disaggregase activity. So there are enzymes that are supposed to prevent, like CLIP-B, which is HSP-104 in eukaryotes, supposed to prevent proteins from inappropriately aggregating and uses ATP to pull them out of aggregates. So it's possible that these, that enzyme system shuts down in the dark. It's also possible for these, the most of, or a lot of the proteins that we're seeing are enzymes that themselves act on substrates. And those substrates might become depleted in the dark. So like um, MetX is supposed to act on a substrate to, that's then gonna go into the biosynthesis of a thionine. If that substrate's not present, maybe that destabilizes the enzyme and it somehow aggregates. Or could there be dark dependent pH changes in the cell that are responsible? We don't really know. But um, we do know that it, from, do, from exploring some possibilities, it seems like really, the energetic status of the cell, not directly some kind of signaling about light and dark, really is the critical determinant. And the reason we say that is the following set of experiments. So we can interrupt um, ATP biosynthesis using things like uncouplers. So DNP dinitrophenol is an uncoupler that allows protons to just cross the cell membrane. So it dissipates the proton gradient across the, the membrane of the bacterial cell. If you add DMP, regardless of the pH of the media, you cause, at least for the, the proteins we tested, cause, we, you cause them to form these sort of insoluble spots. And there are other ways you can do this too. You can directly uh, target ATP synthase. That also will cause this to happen. Uh, but maybe more importantly, you can make genetic perturbations to uh, glycogen uh, metabolism. So glycogen is the primary source of energy in the dark. If you interrupt glycogen breakdown, that also causes these uh, fluorescent spots to form more quickly. And um, you can... Sorry to jump in, Mike, but you yes. have just five minutes left. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I might, if there was a chat message, I might not have seen it. Sorry about that. Okay, and, and then finally, you can do the, the reverse kind of experiment. So it turns out you can, you can get these cells to take up sugar to give them an alternative source of metabolism by basically giving them a sugar transporter from, this is an E. coli sugar transporter, you can express it, that will get these cyanobacteria to take up glucose and sort of bolster their metabolism, and that will also prevent... Um, these enzymes from condensing into spots. So it's, it's somehow telling you about the metabolic status of the cell, and maybe that's really what's being programmed by the clock, uh, is a kind of metabolic change during the night. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's phenomenology, and that's kind of the state of what we know. And, um, but I think that the picture is kind of interesting. So sort of like, uh, Maybe not like a eukaryotic cell, but um, but you know I guess it it sort of um, reinforces this idea that maybe you should not think of a bacterial cell as just being a, a well mixed bag of soluble components, uh, because we now know from this and other examples, in the natural kind of conditions. I mean I shouldn't say natural, but in realistic kind of conditions where you're cycling between day and night you have uh, these reversible cycles of, of parts of the proteum going from being well mixed throughout the cell to condensing into some kind of structures that can then be pulled apart again the next day. 
And so things we don't know, are there actually many distinct aggregates or are some of these proteins all aggregating together? Are the enzymes active when they're in the aggregates? We still, we've, we've been trying to answer that question, we still don't know. Um, and do these actually, similar to the eukaryotic stories, do they contain RNA or is it really just protein? We don't find a lot of RNA binding proteins, um, but that's, that's a question. Okay, um, and then what is the molecular mechanism? So in the, in the spirit of just trying to be totally upfront about our ignorance, um, I'll, this, this is all we don't know. Okay, um, and so I really want to um, acknowledge so Paul Patnaik, who's a staff scientist in my lab who really led this project and got interested in these questions. Uh, and this whole thing was a really nice collaboration between him and a postdoc, Yi Lao. He's uh, really an expert in doing microscopy um, and, and made all the movies that I showed you. And so with that, I'll just list all the people in my lab and um, these funding sources that have made it possible for us to uh, try, try weird experiments. So I'll stop there and um, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks Mike for an excellent talk. And we have a bunch of questions and I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but uh, at the very beginning, um, Rudo, Rudro Biswas asked, what kind of comparison should I make to see that the clock is comparatively better temperature compensated? Oh, you mean to, so let me, uh, well, I'll try to answer that question and tell me if I got it wrong. Um, later, tell me if I got it wrong, I guess. So right, so is it, um, so if you read in biochemistry textbooks, they will say things like typical enzymes, if you increase the temperature by a factor, by 10 degrees centigrade, you will increase the activity by two to three fold. Um, and whereas these clock systems, it's more like, the, over t with a 10 degree change, their period changes by 10% or something, okay? But, um, but I actually have become kind of skeptical that, you know, I think you should always be nervous if you read in a textbook, oh, typical enzymes do this. So I don't, I'm not aware, like it's certainly true you can find enzymes where if you increase by like a restriction enzyme, right? It's like you change the temperature by 10 degrees, its activity is very different. Um, but whether that's really some kind of universal law of enzymes that clock are violating, I don't think that's, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think there's a good systematic understanding actually. Like what is the null model? What is a random enzyme? What is its temperature dependence? I don't think people know actually. Uh, there's uh, another question. Uh, I'm gonna skip a few and uh, Jonathan Rodenfels asked uh, about the mechanisms of the condensates and he wants to know if uh, enzymes bind mRNA, and given the observation that the ribosome occupancy of mRNA, or given, or, sorry, I thought it was a question. Uh, given the observation that the ribosome occupancy of mRNA is strongly reduced. Um, so you actually see, okay, so we don't know if there are, if there is RNA in these structures, these condensates that we can spin down. Um, that's kind of a future question. But actually, the, um, you see the ribosomes actually go at night, go into the soluble fraction. And I think that's because most of the translation is happening um, co-transcriptionally during the day. So they're associated with the genome and polymerases, and it's easier to spin them down um, during the day. And you can actually, yeah, actually at night, the ribosomes get released from all those structures. So ribosomes are not in these dark globs. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and Ralph Bunshu asks, if you tag different proteins with different colors, would the spots co-localize? And are there any sequence or other physical determinants that make a protein member of the condensing pool? Um, yeah, okay. Those are both really good questions. We have tried, <laughs> um, we've tried the, the first experiment, tagging things with like YFP and CFP. And I would say um, somehow, it, it, it's like they don't exactly overlap, but somehow, I don't know, we need to do like some super resolution imaging or something and try to figure that out. And we have not been able to figure out if there are sequence determinants. Um, they're not like, they're not like, 
obvious low complexity sequences or something like that. But that's typical of bacterial gene, like bacterial genomes just have far less low complexity sequence in, in coding sequences than the eukaryotic or, you know, metazoan genomes. So, but, but people have shown recently, like in yeast, that in some of these proteins with low complexity regions, you can remove them and they still will phase separate. So sorry to just, every answer is just, I don't know. Sorry, we don't know, we don't really know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that means you have lots of cool experiments to do, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, I think that we, um, we might have, uh, well, uh, Sarah Liam asked, is transcription and translation levels uh, getting lower in the dark due to external cue of light dark cycle, or is it a downstream circadian control, or is it somehow due to cell division uh, activity that happens in the dark? So cell division actually doesn't happen in the dark. It's, that's kind of interesting. There are like in eukaryotic algae that does happen, but actually cell division is neat. In these, they ha has to happen more like in the middle of the day. It actually gets shut off before night, five o'clock. Um, as to why transcription gets shut off, I think it is, so it's another thing we don't, we don't really know. Um, it's certainly, I think it's the answer is gonna be it's a combination it's a combination of both the clock signaling and um, and a, a direct influence of the environment. I think I think that's going to actually the story for many things that it's like the environment is going to do something to the cell, but the clock like modulates its impact. So um, yeah, the clock is kind of like a fine tuning thing. <laughs>